teach computer science to middle school and high school students, there are always two challenges that I face. One challenge is that of being able to, to um, deal with the mixed abilities of the students in the classroom and differentiate the instruction and the activities that I give to them. The other is dealing with the challenges of engaging the students so that everybody's participating and, and joining in on the uh, group activities. This is particularly uh, of interest when there are a lot of females in the class and dealing with things like the imposter syndrome where it's been shown that young women in computer science classes often feel intimidated or lack the confidence when there are, are younger males or uh, the same age that are constantly asking questions. So having uh, ways and strategies to deal with that is um, a toolbox that we as teachers can have. So a few times when I've taught in the past, I've realized that my classes were totally disengaged. Perhaps not so bad as what we see here if you've seen the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off where the actor Ben Klein is teaching a class and he's just repetitively asking the class to answer the question by saying anyone, anyone. If you haven't seen that video clip, check out the YouTube uh, references here. So what we'd like to do as CS principals is a way to better engage our students, to get them active in the the daily experiences and activities that we give them and everyone being a participant. So although we really feel that CS Principal is a great curriculum and can increase the interest of computer science among our students, one thought is that curriculum alone is not going to engage students directly. So instead of just relying on the curriculum, we also need to have pedagogical structures that help us to teach the content that we like to get out to our students and things like dealing with the imposter syndrome or this macho culture can also be handled by some new strategies that have been proposed. So over the past year, I've been uh, interested in something that I've, I've newly discovered. Some of you may already know about these if you're from an education background. But this is the literature on cooperative learning. In particular, the Kagan style of cooperative learning where there's pedagogical structures that are used in a classroom to help with all kinds of things from building up your class, to developing a rapport among team members, to issues with classroom management and social skills. And all these structures are content free, so they can be taught in any kind of class and specialized for that class with some, some forethought. So kind of like what we would call design patterns in computer science or strategies or structures for teaching that can be applied in many different scenarios. So if you're interested, there's a really good book on this that's uh, shown here in the slides. Kagan also has lectures and um, seminars throughout the year that you can check out on their webpage. One thing that I learned from attending these lectures is that group work uh, is not cooperative learning. So we can take our classrooms and assign them into individual groups and then ask the students to do things and just with that structure alone it's not going to always produce the desired effect of having everybody participate. So even within a group, there can be members of that group that dominate the discussion and, and fall back into a situation maybe even worse than the traditional classroom where there's just a few people who are, are dominating the participation. So what we'd like to be able to do is find a way to engage all the students continually throughout the classroom experience. So the Kagan approach has developed a, an acronym called PIES, and there's four basic principles to this that they advocate for cooperative learning and they are, they're designed to drive the participation and engagement in your class. So those four parts of this philosophy are positive interdependence, individual accountability, equal participation, and simultaneous interaction. So Kagan and others have done research on this to show how this PIES approach not only engages students better, but also increases diversity and some of the differentiated learning needs in, your, in a classroom. So just to go over quickly what these four pieces of the puzzle mean. A positive interdependence is when the classroom activity is totally organized in a way where the students work together on a, as a team towards a common goal. So it's not in the case where each student is feeling like they're competing with the other student for praise, which is often the case in traditional classrooms. The uh, individual accountability idea of PIES is where each student is forced in some way to participate in the classroom activity. So no student can kind of lay, lay back and hide or, or take a free ride off of the discussion of others, which can often happen even in, in group work. So it's kind of counter to the anyone approach of um, traditional classrooms. 
And, and one way to do this and facilitate the individual accountability and some of the other goals of PIES is to break the classroom up where we have individual tables uh, aligned so that the students are facing each other in pairs. So, for example, uh, two, two uh, separate desks where there are four students surrounding a table where there's two groups of pairs working together. Equal participation is another core topic of PIES where students each have an equal amount of time to participate and have their voices heard and their thoughts um, considered uh, among the team in, the, in that particular dynamic. So it involves active engagement of all the students, just not a few, and also can help challenge the macho culture in computer science that's been described by giving uh, all of the students in the class a voice and, and not just being dominated by a select few. So simultaneous interaction is interesting because it has two different purposes. First is we, we have the ability throughout the classroom to have all of the students engaged at the same time. So not only does it help with the engagement of the class, but it can also help with the efficiency of the class. So rather than introducing a, a topic and just having one student in your class out of 20 answer that, we can instead have the entire class working in teams or pairs or other organizations where the entire class is doing something. So you can look at a, a snapshot of a classroom that practices these Kagan structures and you can see a very active classroom with, with students walking around and interacting and discussing uh, the topics with each other. There's also an ability to use these structures for class building. So as Kagan defines it, class building is the process by which a room full of individuals with different backgrounds and experiences become a caring community of active learners. So in class building, the students are up out of their seat, walking around, interacting with others, very non-traditional. So administrators may need to be accustomed to this as well because students aren't just sitting in their seats all the time. So students are forming those bonds with other class members by helping with answers to prompts that are fun, maybe offered once per week, and sometimes content driven as needed. There's also team building structures. So this is where four students with all kind of uh, different backgrounds and experiences come together and, and build a team. And also we use uh, fun activities to initiate these team building exercises. And it's very important in computer science principles to be able to do this because of the nature of the performance tasks and the, the team nature of the way that those are turned in and performed and executed throughout the course. So a couple examples of these structures. So one structure that's described is matched mind. So in matched mind, there's a barrier between two students where they can't see each other. And one student is giving a drawing or, or some kind of visual representation, and they have to describe very precisely to the other student what they see and the other student on the other side must then draw or somehow build the same thing that the, the first student sees. So this is really helpful towards teaching, for example, the precision of algorithms or encoding, the importance of correctness, and the detail that's needed in computer science for preciseness. So you can also differentiate this activity. So really advanced students, instead of doing a two-dimensional structure, might be asked to replicate a three-dimensional structure. For example, um, some kind of Lego structure on one side that uh, one student describes the other and the, and the second student must rebuild. A second example of a structured learning technique is jot thoughts. So in brainstorming, there's several activities. One is divergent thinking. So being able to collect a whole bunch of different ideas and then as a team, use con convergent thinking to be able to reach down and pick some of those best ideas for discussion. So Jot Thoughts helps to facilitate that and it's very useful also for the performance task when trying to arrive at a particular problem that the students might want to work on in one of the tasks. So teammates cover the table by writing ideas on slips of paper. Each teammate will say their thought or their suggestion, uh, write it down and then place that on the table and we'll go around the circle in a round robin style where each student gets to participate and say something about the particular task and then all students will begin discussing all the things that are on the table and arrive at a particular consensus on what are some of the best things that emerged. There's also been some research on how brain activity and kinesthetic learning uh, are in combination with each other. These cooperative structures, students often feel safer 
than in a traditional classroom where the student may be threatened by a, a dominant personality. In these structures, every student has a say and each one can equally participate. It's also been shown that students like new content, but they crave predictability in the structure. So having these structures across your entire course year, but introducing a new content can be very useful. And also the kinesthetic activity improves glucose levels in the brain have been studied by, by several learning scientists. Positive reinforcement is also an important characteristic of encouraging and engaging students. In a traditional classroom, the uh, reinforcement's typically only given to one person, the person who answers a question or makes a comment. In cooperative structures, the entire class receives positive reinforcement throughout the whole uh, class period, particularly through peer enforcement, reinforcement. So peer praise happens after each activity. Whenever an activity is done, the peers congratulate each other and talk about how they benefited from the discussion. And it's also been shown in literature that the peer discussion can be more effective even than teacher praise. So these cooperative learning structures are very useful as we've talked about and also when we apply them to computer science there's a lot of low-lying fruit. There have been many people who've applied these structures to other disciplines and mathematics and, and spelling and all kinds of other topics from K through 5 up through high school and Kagan sells books on all of those, but there's been very little done to explore this new philosophy on computer science topics. So there's a lot of low-lying fruit where we can look at how these apply to the CS principles curriculum. So there's been some work on pedagogical design patterns from the mid-90s, but not much more beyond that. So even applying a few of these throughout the year of your course may help a lot in terms of bringing out the engagement in the, in the diversity and the encouragement of your students that we all desire. So in summary, curriculum alone is not going to drive the engagement and diversity that we seek in our classes for CS principles. We also need structure in the organization in the way that the teams and the students interact with each other. So I invite you to look at the cooperative learning structures and think about ways that they can be applied to your class. And throughout the rest of the course, occasionally we'll talk about some of these and integrate them in with the, the course discussion.